Hibernation 50. Grizzlies Growls presents Stories from the Hibernation. Read by David Grizzly Smith. Wild Animals I Have Known by Ernest Thompson Seton As read by David Grizzly Smith The Story of a Cottontail Rabbit Ragilug, or Rag, was the name of a young cottontail rabbit. It was given him from his torn and ragged ear, a life mark he got in his first adventure. He lived with his mother in Oliphant Swamp, where I made their acquaintance and gathered, in a hundred different ways, the little bits of proof and scraps of truth that at length enabled me to write this history. Now, those who do not know the animals well may think I have humanized them, but those who have lived so near them as to know somewhat of their ways and their minds will not think so. Now, truly, rabbits have no speech as we understand it, but they have a way of conveying ideas by a system of sounds and sights, scents, whisker touches, movements, and example that answers the purpose of speech. And it must be remembered that Though, in telling this story, I freely translate from rabbit to English, I repeat nothing they did not say. Part 1 the rank swamp grass bent over and concealed the snug nest where Ragalug's mother had hidden him. She had partly covered him with some of the bedding, and, as always, her last warning was to lie low and say nothing, whatever happens. Though tucked in bed, he was wide awake, and his bright eyes were taking in that part of his little green world that was straight above a blue jay and a red squirrel, two notorious thieves, were loudly berating each other for stealing, and at one time Rag's home bush was the center of their fight. A yellow warbler caught a blue butterfly but six inches from his nose, and a scarlet and black ladybug, serenely waving her knobbed feelers, took a long walk up one grass blade, down another, and across the nest and over Rag's face yet he never moved or even winked. Well, after a while he heard a strange rustling of the leaves in the near thicket. It was an odd, continuous sound, and though it went this way and that way and came ever nearer, there was no patter of feet with it. Oreg had lived his whole life in the swamp, he was three weeks old, and yet had never heard anything like this. Of course, his curiosity was greatly aroused. His mother had cautioned him to lie low, but that was understood to be in case of danger, and this strange sound without footfalls could not be anything to fear. The low rasping went past close at hand, then to the right, and then back, and seemed going away. Rag felt he knew what he was about. He wasn't a baby. It was his duty to learn what it was. He slowly raised his roly-poly body on his short, fluffy legs, lifted his little round head above the covering of his nest, and peeped out into the woods. The sound had ceased as soon as he moved. He saw nothing, 
so took one step forward to a clear view and instantly found himself face to face with an enormous black serpent. Mammy, he screamed in mortal terror as the monster darted at him. With all the strength of his tiny limbs he tried to run, but in a flash the snake had him by one ear and whipped around him with his coils to gloat over the helpless little baby bunny he had secured for dinner. "'Mammy! Mammy!' gasped poor little Raggedy as the cruel monster began slowly choking him to death. Very soon the little one's cry would have ceased, but bounding through the woods straight as an arrow came Mammy, no longer a shy, helpless little Molly Cottontail, ready to fly from a shadow, The mother's love was strong in her. The cry of her baby had filled her with the courage of a hero, and hop she went over that horrible reptile. Whack she struck down at him with her sharp hind claws as she passed, giving him such a stinging blow that he squirmed with pain and hissed with anger. Mammy came feebly from the little one, and Mammy came leaping again and again and struck harder and fiercer until the loathsome reptile let go of the little one's ear and tried to bite the old one as she leapt over. But all he got was a mouthful of wool each time, and Molly's fierce blows began to tell as long bloody rips were torn in the black snake's scaly armor. Things were now looking bad for the snake, and bracing himself for the next charge, he lost his tight hold on the baby bunny, who had once wriggled out of the coils and away into the underbrush, breathless and terribly frightened, but unhurt save that his left ear was much torn by the teeth of that dreadful serpent. Molly now had gained all she wanted. She had no notion of fighting for glory or revenge. Away she went into the woods, and the little one followed the shining beacon of her snow-white tail until she led him to a safe corner of the swamp. Part 2 Old Oliphant Swamp was a rough brambly tract of second-growth woods, with a marshy pond and a stream through the middle. A few ragged remnants of the old forest still stood in it, and a few of the still older trunks were lying about as dead logs in the brushwood. The land about the pond was of that willow-grown, sedgy kind that cats and horses avoid, but that cattle do not fear. The drier zones were overgrown with briars and young trees. The outermost belt of all, that next the fields, was of thrifty, gummy-trunked young pines, whose living needles in air and dead ones on earth offer so delicious an odor to the nostrils of the passer-by, and so deadly a breath to those seedlings that would compete with them for the worthless waste they grow on. All around for a long way were smooth fields, and the only wild tracks that ever crossed those fields were those of a thoroughly bad and unscrupulous fox that lived only too near. The chief indwellers of the swamp were Molly and Rag. Their nearest neighbors were far away, and their nearest kin were dead. This was their home, and here they lived together, and here Rag received the training that made his success in life. Molly was a good little mother, and gave him a careful bringing up. First thing he learned was to lie low and say nothing. His adventure with the snake taught him the wisdom of this. Rag never forgot that lesson. Afterward he did as he was told, and it made the other things come more easily. The second lesson he learned was freeze. It grows out of the first, and Rag was taught it as soon as he could run. Freezing is simply doing nothing, turning into a statue. As soon as he finds a foe near, no matter what he is doing, a well-trained cottontail keeps just as he is and stops all movement, for the creatures of the woods are of the same color as the things in the woods, and catch the eye only while moving. So, when enemies chance together, the one who first sees the other can keep himself unseen by freezing, and thus have all the advantage of choosing the time for attack or escape. 
Only those who live in the woods know the importance of this. Every wild creature and every hunter must learn it. All learn to do it well, but not one of them can beat Molly Cottontail in the doing. Rag's mother taught him this trick by example. When the white cotton cushion that she always carried to sit on went bobbing away through the woods, of course Rag ran his hardest to keep up. But when Molly stopped and froze, the natural wish to copy made him do the same. But the best lesson of all that Rag learned from his mother was the secret of the briar brush. It's a very old secret now, and to make it plain you must first hear why the briar brush quarreled with the beasts. Long ago the roses used to grow on bushes that had no thorns, but the squirrels and mice used to climb after them. The cattle used to knock them off with their horns, the possum would twitch them off with his long tail, and the deer, with his sharp hooves, would break them down. So the briar brush armed itself with spikes to protect its roses, and declared eternal war on all creatures that climbed trees, or had horns, or hoofs, or long tails. This left the briar brush at peace with none but Molly Cottontail, who could not climb, was hornless, hoofless, and scarcely had any tail at all. In truth, the cottontail had never harmed Briar Rose, and having now so many enemies, the rose took the rabbit into a special friendship, and when dangers are threatening poor Bunny, he flies to the nearest briar brush, certain that it is ready with a million keen and poisoned daggers to defend him. So the secret that Rag learned from his mother was, the briar brush is your best friend. Much of the time that season was spent in learning the lay of the land and the bramble and briar mazes. Rag learned them so well he could go all around the swamp by two different ways and never leave the friendly briars at any place for more than five hops. It is not long since the foes of the cottontails were disgusted to find that man had brought a new kind of bramble and planted it in long lines throughout the country. It was so strong that no creatures could break it down, so sharp that the toughest skin was torn by it. Each year there was more of it, and each year it became a more serious matter to the wild creatures. But Molly Cottontail had no fear of it. She was not brought up in the briars for nothing. Dogs and foxes, cattle and sheep, and even man himself might be torn by those fearful spikes. But Molly understands it, and lives and thrives under it. And the further it spreads, the more safe country there is for the cottontail. And the name of this new and dreaded bramble is the barbed wire fence. Part 3. Molly had no other children to look after now, so Rag had all her care. He was unusually quick and bright as well as strong, and he had uncommonly good chances, so he got on remarkably well. All the season she kept him busy learning the tricks of the trail, and what to eat and drink, and what not to touch. Day by day she worked to train him, Little by little she taught him, putting into his mind hundreds of ideas that her own life, or early training, had stored in hers, and so equipped him with the knowledge that makes life possible to their kind. Close by her side in the clover field or the thicket he would sit and copy her when she wobbled her nose to keep her smeller clear, and pull the bite from her mouth or taste her lips to make sure he was getting the same kind of fodder. Still copying her, he learned to comb his ears with his claws and to dress his coat and to bite the burrs out of his vest and socks. He learned, too, that nothing but clear dewdrops from the briars were fit for a rabbit to drink, 
as water which had once touched the earth must surely bear some taint. Thus he began the study of woodcraft, the oldest of all sciences. As soon as Rag was big enough to go out alone, his mother taught him the signal code. Rabbits telegraph each other by thumping on the ground with their hind feet. Along the ground sound carries far. A thump that at six feet from the earth is not heard at twenty yards will, near the ground, be heard at least one hundred yards. Rabbits have very keen hearing, and so might hear this same thump at two hundred yards, and that would reach from end to end of Oliphant Swamp. A single thump means look out or freeze. A slow thump-thump means come. A fast thump-thump means danger, and a very fast thump-thump-thump means run for your dear life. At another time, when the weather was fine and the blue jays were quarreling among themselves, a sure sign that no dangerous foe was about, Rag began a new study. Molly, by flattening her ears, gave the sign to squat. Then she ran far away in the thicket and gave the thumping signal for calm. Rag set out at a run to the place, but could not find Molly. He thumped, but got no reply. Setting carefully about his search, he found her foot scent, and following this strange guide that the beasts all know so well and man does not know at all, he worked out the trail and found her where she was hidden. Thus he got his first lesson in trailing, and thus it was that the games of hide-and-seek they played became the schooling for the serious chase of which there was so much in his afterlife. Before that first season of schooling was over, he had learnt all the principal tricks by which a rabbit lives, and in not a few problems showed himself a veritable genius. He was adept at tree, dodge, and squat. He could play log lump, with wind and bulk, with back tracks so well he scarcely needed any other tricks. He had not yet tried it, but he knew just how to play barbed wire, which is a new trick of the brilliant order. He'd made a special study of sand, which burns up all scent, and was deeply versed in change-off, fence, and double, as well as hole up, which is a trick requiring longer notice, and yet he never forgot that lie low is the beginning of all wisdom, and briar brush the only trick that is always safe. He was taught the signs by which to know all his foes, and the best way to baffle them. For hawks, owls, foxes, hounds, curs, minks, weasels, cats, skunks, coons, and men, each have a different plan of pursuit, and for each and all of these evils he was taught a remedy. And for knowledge of the enemy's approach he learnt to depend first on himself and his mother, and then on the blue jay. "'Never neglect the blue jay's warning,' said Molly." He's a mischief-maker, a marplot, and a thief all the time, but nothing escapes him. He wouldn't mind harming us, but he cannot, thanks to the briars, and his enemies are ours, so it is well to heed him. Now, if the woodpecker cries a warning, you can trust him. He is honest, but he's a fool beside the blue jay, and though the blue jay often tells lies for mischief, you are safe to believe him when he brings ill news." The barbed wire trick takes a deal of nerve and the best of legs. It was long before Rag ventured to play it, but as he came to his full powers it became one of his favorites. "'It's a fine play for those who can do it,' said Molly. First you lead off your dog on a straightaway and warm him up a bit by nearly letting him catch you. Then keeping just one hop ahead you lead him at a long slant full tilt into a breast-high barbed wire. I've seen many a dog and fox crippled.' One big hound killed outright this way, but I've also seen more than one rabbit lose his life in trying it. Rag early learnt what some rabbits never learn at all, that hole-up is not such a fine ruse as it seems. It may be the certain safety of a wise rabbit, but soon or late is a sure death-trap to a fool. A young rabbit always thinks of it first. An old rabbit never tries it till all others fail. It means escape from a man or a dog, a fox or a bird of prey, but it means sudden death if the foe is a ferret, a mink, a skunk, or a weasel. There were two ground holes in the swamp, one on the sunning bank, which is a dry, sheltered knoll in the south end, 
It was open and sloping to the sun, and here, on fine days, the cottontails took their sun baths. They stretched out among the fragrant pine needles and winter green in odd cat-like positions, turned slowly over as though roasting and wishing all sides well done. And they blinked and panted and squirmed as if in dreadful pain, yet this was one of the keenest enjoyments they knew. At just over the brow of the knoll was a large pine stump. Its grotesque roots wriggled out above the yellow sand bank like dragons, and under their protecting claws a sulky old woodchuck had digged a den long ago. He became more sour and ill-tempered as the weeks went by. One day waited to quarrel with Oliphant's dog instead of going in, so that Molly Cottontail was able to take possession of the den an hour later. This, the pine root hole, was afterward very coolly taken by a self-sufficient young skunk, who with less valor might have enjoyed greater longevity, for he imagined that even man with a gun would fly from him. Well, instead of keeping Molly from the den for good, therefore, his reign, like that of a certain Hebrew king, was over in seven days. The other, the fern hole, was in a fern thicket next to the clover field. It was small and damp, useless except as a last retreat. It was also the work of a woodchuck, a well-meaning, friendly neighbor, but a hare-brained youngster whose skin in the form of a whiplash was now developing higher horsepower in the elephant working team. Simple justice, said the old man, for that hide was raised on stolen feed that the team would have turned into horsepower anyway. Now the cottontails were now sole owners of the holes and did not go near them when they could help it, lest anything like a path that should be made that might betray these last retreats to an enemy. There was also the hollow hickory, which, though nearly fallen, was still green, had the great advantage of being open at both ends. This had long been the residence of one Lotor, a solitary old coon whose ostensible calling was frog hunting, and who, like the monks of old, was supposed to abstain from all flesh food. But it was shrewdly suspected that he needed but a chance to indulge in a diet of rabbit, when at last, one dark night, he was killed while raiding Oliphant's hen house, Molly, so far from feeling a pang of regret, took possession of his cozy nest with a sense of unbounded relief. Part 4. Bright August sunlight was flooding the swamp in the morning. Everything seemed soaking in the warm radiance. A little brown swamp sparrow was teetering on a long rush in the pond. Beneath him there were open spaces of dirty water that brought down a few scraps of the blue sky, and worked it and the yellow duckweed into an exquisite mosaic with a little wrong-side picture of the bird in the middle. On the bank behind was a great vigorous growth of golden-green skunk cabbage that cast a dense shadow over the brown swamp tussocks. The eyes of the swamp sparrow were not trained to take in the color glories, but he saw what we might have missed, that two of the numberless leafy brown bumps under the broad cabbage leaves were furry living things with noses that never ceased to move up and down, whatever else was still. It was Molly and Rag. They were stretched under the skunk cabbage, not because they liked its rank smell, but because the winged ticks could not stand it at all, and so left them in peace. Rabbits have no set time for lessons. They're always learning. But what the lesson is depends on the present stress, and that must arrive before it is known. They went to this place for a quiet rest, but had not been long there when suddenly a warning note from the ever-watchful blue jay caused Molly's nose and ears to go up and her tail to tighten to her back. 
Away across the swamp was Oliphant's big black and white dog coming straight toward them. Now, said Molly, squat, will I go and keep that fool out of mischief? Away she went to meet him, and she fearlessly dashed across the dog's path. Bow, he fairly yelled as he bounded after Molly, but she kept just beyond his reach and led him where the million daggers struck fast and deep, till his tender ears were scratched raw and guided him at last plump into a hidden barbed wire fence, where he got such a gashing he went homeward howling with pain. Well, after making a short double, a loop, and a balk in case the dog should come back, Molly returned to find that Rag, in his eagerness, was standing bolt upright and craning his neck to see the sport. This disobedience made her so angry that she struck him with her hind foot and knocked him over in the mud. One day, as they fed on the near clover field, a red-tailed hawk came swooping after them. Molly kicked up her hind legs to make fun of him and skipped into the briars along one of their old pathways, where, of course, the hawk could not follow. It was the main path from the creekside thicket to the stovepipe brush pile. Several creepers had grown across it, and Molly, keeping one eye on the hawk, set to work and cut the creepers off. Rag watched her, and then ran on ahead and cut some more that were across the path. That's right, said Molly. Always keep the runways clear. You'll need them often enough. Not wide, but clear. Cut everything like a creeper across them, and... Some day you'll find you'll cut a snare. A what? said Rag, as he scratched his right ear with his left hind foot. A well, snare is something that looks like a creeper, but it doesn't grow, and it's worse than all the hawks in the world, said Molly, glancing at the now far away red tail, for there it hides night and day in the runaway till the chance to catch you comes. "'I don't believe it could catch me,' said Rag, with the pride of youth, as he rose on his heels to rub his chin and whiskers high up on a smooth sapling. Rag did not know he was doing this, but his mother saw, and knew it was a sign, like the changing of a boy's voice, that her little one was no longer a baby, but would soon be a grown-up cottontail.' Thank you for listening to Stories from the Hibernation. Comment on the website at grizzliesgrowls.com. This program is offered under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.